Michael, you're on. Thank you very much, Anton, and thank you very much for coming out this morning. I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to engage with you on the work that we're all doing uh, to improve, continually improve the quality of the health system in, in Ontario. And I just want to say at, at the outset that uh, certainly our vision is really quite simple, uh, and that is that we can and will create the best health systems in the world in Ontario. And I firmly believe that we can do that, and we're on the path to doing that together. We have seen tremendous progress, I believe, in Ontario over the last uh, 10 years, and we for sure have a lot of work to do together, but I think we can see how to get there and we can see the levers that we need to implement in a coordinated way to realize uh, that vision. And so I'm tremendously excited to be here with all of you today and to have the opportunity with Neil and Rick to share with you how harnessing the power of information is really at the center of all of the work that we're doing together uh, to create that health system uh, in Ontario for Ontario's public and Ontario's patients. But before I get into that, I do want to talk uh, briefly about the recent issue uh, that's impacted the lives of many Ontarians receiving chemotherapy. I think it's very helpful to look at this issue. It's certainly of deep concern to all of us. Facing a cancer diagnosis is obviously extremely difficult on its own, let alone finding out that the treatment may have been compromised. And we all have a shared responsibility in understanding how this happened uh, and to enable us to make the system safer and of higher quality uh, for the future. And our thoughts and concern remain with those patients and their families affected by this. As you know, as announced, by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, uh, Dr. Jake Thiessen is leading an independent review of quality assurance in the province's cancer drug supply chain to safeguard patient care. And his review will focus on this recent discovery of underdosing in chemotherapy drugs at five hospitals in Ontario and New, and New Brunswick. And so, for us, patient care and safety is our number one priority, and we're very happy to support Dr. Thiessen and all of the partners engaged in this work, all of the organizations that I can assure you are working very hard together every day uh, to support the work that Dr. Thiessen is going to do, and we hope provide good recommendations, as I'm sure he will, as to how we can improve the system uh, for the future. Now, quality improvement depends on our response to fundamental changes uh, that I think are happening in the dynamics of healthcare in the province. So, healthcare today and for the foreseeable future is going to face continuing and increasing demands for better quality care, pressures to reduce costs, increase the value we deliver for the dollars we invest and the importance of becoming more patient-centered and delivering better outcomes uh, for that investment. And one of the key ways I think that we've learned together that we can respond to these changes is by using the power of data through the development of information through analytics to, em to enable improvements at every stage of the patient journey. And what we'd like to talk to you today is a little bit about how we, with you, have been doing that, how we collect and use information at every step in the patient journey. As you probably know, at CCO, we collect data across cancer and chronic kidney disease and in our work with respect to access to a variety of healthcare services uh, associated with the government's wait times, ELC, ALC and ER strategies. 
And that's on everything from incidents, wait times, mortality, survival, and everything along the way. And then our job is to transform that data into meaningful information, use the information in, to encourage and support broader improvements across Ontario's health systems. I just want to focus on a, on a very recent example of how the Ministry of Health is working with partners across the province and where data is going to be critical in the transformation of that data into useful information. And that's in the example of health links. So we know from data that's been collected by the Ministry and others that we have uh, patients in the system in Ontario who could be better managed through a coordinated approach to their care at the local level. And with personalized care plans uh, developed by now, we have 19 early adopter health links across the province. The hope is that by using data and information in a better, more integrated way across providers at a local level, that patients can receive the quality of care that they need when they need it and where they need it. Another example that I'll focus on is one centered at Cancer Care Ontario, and again, how we're using data to make improvements across the patient journey. In 2008, CCO developed an integrated cancer screening strategy, and this was aimed at leveraging information in our data holdings to create the first population-based organized colorectal screening program of its kind in Canada. And this work with partners across the province was a, was a tremendous effort. It, through our colon cancer check program, identified approximately 3 million Ontarians who are eligible for screening. And was subsequently leveraging that platform, uh, that technology platform that enabled us to reach out to those individuals across the province to enhance the data capture and reporting activities for all cancer screening programs, including breast and, and cervical screening. So these are some examples of how data and information is critical to the launch of initiatives that are going, going to improve uh, quality of patient care. But I wanted to tell the broader story from a patient perspective and show how all of the work that we're doing together with respect to data and information comes together around a patient story. And I'm going to talk about John. So John is 56, he's slightly overweight, he's a moderate drinker and a non-smoker. His diet isn't all that it should be, he works at a desk, doesn't get much exercise, he's got a pretty common level of stress and he visits his doctor regularly. John is pretty average uh, for Ontarians today. Now when John turned 50, our colon cancer check program identified him as a candidate for colorectal screening and we sent him a letter advising him to speak to his doctor about using the fecal occult blood test uh, for colorectal cancer screening. Now unfortunately John didn't follow up but six years after we sent him that first screening letter John at his doctor's urging completed the FOBT test and sent it in and a lab test comes back positive and as a result, John's doctor booked him in for a colonoscopy. When he arrived at his local cancer center several weeks later, he was enrolled in a diagnostic assessment program. And this program puts his care in the hands of a multidisciplinary healthcare team that will manage and coordinate his care from testing to diagnosis. Now, unfortunately, John's tests reveal that he has advanced colorectal cancer that requires complex surgery, followed by chemotherapy. And another initiative and program that we have developed with partners across the province is for John's physicians and other healthcare professionals to convene a multidisciplinary cancer conference. This brings clinicians together with various areas of expertise together to ensure that the decisions about John's case are made collaboratively and consider each area of special, specialty. Now it's decided that John should undergo surgery and this has to follow Cancer Care Ontario's surgical oncology guidelines, another program backed by data and information for providers 
And in John's case, the guidelines require that his surgeon remove at least 12 lymph nodes surrounding the portion of the colon that is removed in order for his pathologist to determine if the cancer has spread. And John's journey, especially the surgery and treatment portions, relies on that pathology. Again, another major initiative in Ontario, our pathology reports now in Ontario for cancer surgery are standardized and submitted in an electronic format. And John benefits by receiving better care planning and outcomes along his journey as a result of that initiative. Now John has his surgery and it goes according to plan. And following that, he begins chemotherapy treatment. And following his chemotherapy treatment, he has follow-up tests that show no signs of colorectal cancer. But his journey is not over and the use of information by his providers to care for John is not over either. His care team at the Cancer Centre need to transition his care back to the family doctor, ensuring that his physician has all the information, tools and guidelines for his care necessary to provide appropriate follow-up support and monitoring for John. All of these protocols together the data and information that support that, support the providers, our ability to manage performance with respect to John's care, will ensure that he gets the right follow-up to monitor for recurrence and ensure he does not have unnecessary diagnostic tests in the future. So through John's journey, we ch we've touched upon just some of the examples of how data and information is used to create knowledge, to provide better insights, to support providers at point of care delivery, allow us to develop system reports with respect to how we are doing in the province for providing highest quality care for John and for all cancer patients in the system. Now on the topic of driving innovation for the future, I just want to take a, a step towards where we can improve our ability to leverage uh, data and information uh, to drive improved quality of care. And one of these areas is through health system funding reform. And I think that this provides an opportunity to look at how we pay for cancer services in the work that Cancer Care Ontario is doing and now in chronic kidney disease with the respect of payment for services for chronic kidney disease but how we can align the payment for services in hospitals and across other providers to make sure that that is tied to highest quality care using data and information to support that journey. And we know that that challenge is going to become greater and greater. In cancer and chronic kidney disease, incidence is rising and this is going to continue as Ontario's population grows and gets older. And so I believe that together we can jointly play a leadership role in healthcare information management, information technology in Ontario, and to use it intelligently to drive quicker and quicker health system improvement. And so with that in mind, what I'd like to do now is to hand over to Rick Skinner, uh, who's our Vice President and Chief Information Officer to give you a flavour in a little more detail about the work that we're doing now, but what we can see in the future as to how we can better use information to drive quality improvement. Rick. Thank you, Michael. And I appreciate the opportunity to give you just a taste of the use of information and analytics to improve both the care that individual patients receive as well as the overall performance of the health system. So a little example. Thomas and Mary are two end-stage renal disease patients and they have started dialysis on the same day. So this is a short graph of how Thomas and Mary are using hospital services, the extent to which they're using them. 
So using our old methodology, we would have said, well, wait a minute, let's see. Thomas started out using more services, so we would predict he would use uh, uh, increased services in the future. But no, that didn't actually happen. Mary, in months uh, four through six, required additional hospital services. And then, subsequent to that, toward the end of the first year of uh, dialysis, Thomas became uh, a very heavy utilizer of hospital services. So why is this important? Well, one, it's important for the care of these two patients in that we should know and should be able to anticipate the kinds of services they're going to require and uh, ensure those services are available. Secondly, it's important to the management of the health system in that if we can identify those patients who are going to require more intensive care or a greater volume of services, we can anticipate that and manage to that. And you can see over thousands of patients, we should be able to predict which patients are going to require the most services. Now in the past, we used to go at this a bit iteratively based upon our best guess. So if you look at this graph, it shows the geographic regions in the province and which regions have the heaviest use of hospital services by the cohort of end-stage renal disease patients. So if you look at this, you'd say, oh wow, look, uh, in the north, uh, it seems that more kidney disease patients are using uh, a heavy volume of hospital services. But as we'll see in a moment, that's not really true, or it's not a good predictor of um, who is going to need these additional services. So based upon this kind of off-the-cuff analysis, we decided to take a bit of a deep dive and attempt to predict on day one of dialysis, which patients were going to need additional services and be able to plan for that. And in this chart, you see that it's not evenly distributed. So in this case, about 10% of the end-stage renal disease patients in the province consume 55% of all the hospital services provided to that population as a whole. So how do we know who is going to comprise that 10% of end-stage renal uh, disease patients? Well, the first thing we need to do is gather information. We have lots of data. But what we need to do with those data is link them together. We need to know information about the patient uh, during his or her primary care journey, during their specialist journey, uh, their demographic information. So we have access, fortunately, to a large number of data sets. And our challenge is to link them together by the patient such that we can look at the variables involved in this particular case, end-stage renal disease. And for this case, we looked at over 80 different variables for this population. Now, I don't know about all of you, but my calculator doesn't do 80 variables across tens of thousands of patients. So we needed some help. And that kind of help is fortunately now available. I'm sure you've all heard of big data. Well, big data is kind of useless unless you can make actionable information out of it. And what we did in this particular example is to use something called machine learning algorithms, or you might think of it as pattern recognition, or you might think of it as a, a complex set of mathematical algorithms that looks at a set of data and attempts to make some sense out of it. In this case, we used a tool called Bayesian Network Analysis, probably not, not that important. But what that tool did is take those 80 variables and determine that only seven of those 80 were sufficient to predict which patients in this population would require additional hospital services. And you can see them listed here. Some of these you probably could have guessed. 
but others maybe not, and in particular the combination of these seven would have been impossible to guess from knowledge, experience, or simply inspecting the data. So why is this important? I'll finish there. You can imagine that Thomas, who in seven months is going to require intensive care, being able to predict that is either one, going to ensure that Thomas gets that care in a proactive manner, or two, that we can intervene such that Thomas needs less of that care. Secondly, from a policy or a health system perspective, if we know the variables that are predictive of heavy utilization in end-stage renal disease patients, we can do something about those variables. We can hire more nephrologists. Uh, we can uh, get more creatinine tests earlier, et cetera. So this kind of analysis, taking large data sets, applying modern mathematics to come up with actionable information benefits everyone from the patient to our entire health system. And with that, I think we're ready for some questions. So my first question, Rick. Um, these are great charts, and we love seeing them. Do you actually use charts like this in your work? Is that what Michael gets, this kind of stuff, or does he get reams of paper? Well, you probably should ask Michael. Um, and uh, I guess the honest answer is a bit of both. Um, because not everything is automated at this point. But if you will, if the audience will come visit our Cancer System Quality Index, uh, which is published every year and due to be published uh, this coming month uh, on the web, you'll see far fancier charts than this that completely specify the state of cancer in this province. And Michael, you might want to just want to respond to your question, Anton, in terms of uh, I think what's a little bit behind the question, which is the, the iterative use of this data. So the, we've got more and more sophisticated ways of analyzing data, producing reports. But I think uh, the use by uh, providers, uh, our clinical programs, administrators like me, uh, how we use the data. It, it's, it's very much uh, a back and forth process. So the, the, the ways in which we can use data, create information is pushing us as an organization to say, boy, what could we do with these data? What are the challenges that we're facing? How could we use this data in a be better way? We use these all the time uh, in, in all of our programs and all of our meetings to look at how we can better use data in the future. Uh, it's, 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 it's very much an engagement process with those who are using the data. And I think what, one other thing that comes out of that is our, all of our capacity to understand what might be done. And, uh, you know, I think Rick has done a terrific job in this province in, in really pushing us, pushing us as an organization, pushing us as a system as what you, can, what you might be able to do and, and we're linking that with the challenges the, that face us. So then just one follow-up question and then I'll start going up there. And how much do you feed to Neil and what does he and the board see? Well, Neil will come up and answer that, but it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, it's an interesting challenge for uh, a board, I think, in terms of overseeing innovation with use of data. Uh, we all know the risks of, of, of data and its use in terms of privacy, security, and also our effectiveness as an organization working with partners to implement that in, in, in useful forms. And I think for all of those reasons, uh, and Neil can speak to some of the challenges from a governance perspective. I mean, I don't think my answer is going to be surprising to anyone. We, we certainly have a lot of reporting into the board and the board committees. Um, we have a, a, a series of dashboards and performance things, both on the cancer side and the renal side, and access to care information for that matter, that come in. And as Michael said, it's, I think it's a, it's a work in progress. It's uh, continually iterative. It, it's very focused, in fact, on the improvement agenda that CCO as an organization has. So if you go to our renal plan or our cancer plan, they set out the areas we're really focusing on for improvement in the system. And, and the reporting, by and large, is, is very much focused on that. And uh, 
and, and it, it's a useful piece. I, I think the challenge for us often is kind of making it manageable and not uh, uh, having it too overwhelming. So maybe I'll ask it on behalf of a few. Are these templates available to anybody who'd like to use them, Rick? Can you just pass them on? or? The templates are available. The people who do them are not. <laughs> Especially Rick. Rick, uh, uh, who came up here from, uh, from the US, is going down to the University of Virginia. And we're sure the University of Virginia has uh, picked up a f phenomenal asset. And uh, we're going to miss you, Rick. These kind of presentations are important. We'll have you back, though. So any questions for this team? Surely some people don't know the answers to everything here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just wondering, in terms of this data, very valuable data, I notice that right now um, this is the data that, would, that we can start interpreting for Ontario. How does this data compare to what's being captured in other provinces and what's being done to ensure that the data between provinces are actually comparable? Maybe I'll just give a broad uh, perspective on that. Rick can go into some of the details. We certainly are, and I think it's very important that in order for us to be able to demonstrate or measure how well we're doing, we, we absolutely need to compare to other provinces. We need to compare ourselves internationally. And that's, that's, that's often difficult to do because of issues of comparability of data, how we measure things. Uh, and so we do put a lot of effort into that. We're involved in uh, an international benchmarking project actually looking at cancer system performance through a number of uh, modules uh, of work comparing us across other jurisdictions. And, and it is a lot of work to pull together, not just to pull together the information, but to be able uh, to compare it. I think I'll leave it to Rick to kind of any judgments on how we're doing in Ontario with respect to the sophistication of our data compared with other jurisdictions. So first of all, to, to follow up on, on Michael's answer, we work quite closely with a number of other organizations whose job it is also to collect data, and in some cases, like Greg and Kai Hai, to do so on a national level. So it's not that we invent these data and collect them and uh, uh, hoard them ourselves. We share data as widely uh, as we possibly can. Now, as far as how we compare with other provinces, we unfortunately are uh, a province of diversity when it comes to, to data and the various systems and means of collecting and storing those data. So our challenge is actually greater than um, most, probably all other provinces in the country. However, given that, at least in cancer and uh, renal disease, We've made a conscious effort over a decade to identify the information we need to manage those portions of the health system and to go get that kind of information. Michael mentioned, for example, uh, our symptom assessment system. So we didn't have any data on the symptoms that cancer patients were experiencing. Well, we built some systems to collect those data, and now we, in fact, have that kind of information to help us manage both at the patient level as well as at the health system level. So in general, I would say that Ontario, again, for that part of the health system that, that we're accountable for, does as well or better than uh, other parts of the country. But we shouldn't be resting on our laurels. There's lots of work to be done, and none of us do a very good job of stringing together information across the entire patient journey. And that's where, at least in my estimation, the real challenge is and the real uh, benefit is once we're able to do that. Sarah, first row on your right. Somebody had a hand up there, and he's, there it is. Thank you for the presentation, most impressive. I, I must admit, uh, I'm coming at it from a pathology point of view, and I know you've done a lot of work with uh, the adult pathology world in 
uh, improving reports and standardization. And I'm from across the street at Sick Kids, and I'm wondering, is there any move to uh, include pediatric pathology uh, in your your sort of future plans? It, it's something we'd like to move toward, and I'm interested to hear what uh, uh, what might be in store. Maybe I can answer that, uh, and I'll answer it in context of our own strategy as an organization in terms of how we might provide best value for the province in terms of the work that we're doing. And, and one, of the, one of the things that we recognized in talking to partners um, across the province as we developed that strategy was that w we are uh, working in areas specifically around cancer, chronic kidney disease, or access to care, where we uh, have capacity, we have infrastructure in place, uh, we have information and data, the, the ability to, to drive improvements. And one of those is in cancer pathology. Um, but it has been focused on adult cancer pathology. And, and so what we have recognized and been working with the Ministry of Health uh, the Ontario Hospital Association, the Ontario Medical Association, is around the concept of in those areas where we might have a, a, a kind of critical mass of infrastructure and support in place, we might broaden that to the broader issues. So uh, you may be aware that we're now working on a, uh, a partnership development actually with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario on some comprehensive quality management programs. And one of the areas that we're looking at is pathology, all pathology in the province in terms of an approach to comprehensive quality management. Uh, so we're working with partners now on what that program might look like. Um, and of course, it's got lots of challenges. Uh, the goal will be to integrate uh, the use of data and information to drive quality across all pathology, integrating provider performance, uh, hospital performance, regional, provincial, into, into one integrated program of quality uh, management. So uh, that's, we're looking at those areas where we might be able to broaden what we're doing uh, in the, beyond cancer and chronic kidney disease in areas where, where it makes sense to do so. And pathology is, is one of those areas that we're looking at right now. In, in your story, Mike, the, you talk about somebody with colorectal cancer and you talk about him as an individual, but the cancer journey is for families. And my, I'm curious about what, what data you collect and how you improve the families, patients and families' experience in going through a cancer journey like that. Maybe I'll start, and uh, I just want to recognize, uh, in response to this question, um, Rick will, can talk to some of the initiatives that we have underway with respect to the patient experience. Um, oh, that's good. <laughs> it's it's raining in here. That's spe um, speaker experience. <laughs> that was a bad speaker experience, but I'll get over it. Don't worry. Uh, I just want to acknowledge actually Neil's role uh, and Neil uh, as our board chair and but uh, I just want to acknowledge Neil and the whole board I think they provide tremendously strong governance in a very uh, challenging environment and one of the areas that the board but particularly Neil has championed and, and this is one of the priorities of the Ontario Cancer Plan and it's central now in the Ontario Renal Plan is accountability to patients in the work that we do and uh, improving the the patient experience, measuring that, having a quality improvement approach to how we respond to patient needs in exactly the same, well, not the, exactly the same way, but using the same uh, rigor and approach and commitment to that as we might do around the quality of a cancer surgery procedure. Um, and, and so we're doing lots of work, and I'd say we're, we're part way along that journey, uh, and there's lots of challenges, not only in this jurisdiction, but many jurisdictions looking at how we can be more accountable to patients, uh, looking at our work from the patient's perspective, and that goes from uh, now having a patient and family advisory council uh, to really guide us in that work uh, because we don't have all the answers for sure in terms of how to do that. A commitment to measurement and improvement accountability uh, for that work uh, as one of the uh, 
primary uh, goals of the Ontario Cancer Plan. And, and, and so I'll, I'll probably hand it over to Rick in terms of some of the initiatives we have with respect to data collection and how we can do that work. So maybe one quick example, and I'd first of all be honest and say we're early on in this in terms of uh, um, really using information to connect families uh, of patients as well as patients. But an example is a system that we've been uh, rolling out uh, to now five different uh, regions across the province that is designed during the diagnostic assessment process that Michael talked about on the front end of uh, determining uh, whether you have cancer and what treatment you should receive is an electronic system that provides the information of what's going to happen, what tests are scheduled next, if that test is positive, what might the next step be. That system is now available both to or to all of the providers who are helping the patient navigate through this incredible, uh, incredibly stressful uh, process. Secondly, to the patient themselves, so they know where they are in this process and what might come next. And third, to authorize family members of that patient so they can help the patient to get through this part of the journey. Yeah, do you want to comment on that? Patient experience work and yeah. commitment to patients. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's one of the most exciting things CCO is taking on. I, I mean, this is maybe a more general comment in some ways. That as I think Michael's presentation indicated, the CCO's business is health improvement and health care improvement. And, and I think the informatics piece is one important competency that CCO as an organization has developed and kind of brings to that mandate. It's got a couple of other ones, which I, we haven't spoken about at length. One is kind of bring the science and the evidence to practice, which is, I think, something CCO has, you know, does uniquely well, and, and it's obviously, as with everything else, a work in prog process. But, and the other one is cl engaging with clinical leaders. But I think, in some ways, the fourth um, sort of key competency, and this is, is a new one that it's, CCO is really just embarking on building up, and I mean, we've got some of the people who've been very involved in developing it in CCO, is this whole thing of engaging with and partnering with patients and patient families. And I, I think CCO is very committed to it. It's, I think um, it's doing some very interesting work. It's partnering with organizations like the Change Foundation that have also been making a contribution in this area. And Shalom, I know your organization is, in fact, you personally have been involved with CCO on this front as well, so we appreciate that too very much. I have a supplementary question. It's, a, it's a, about, about eight months ago, the New York Times declared that cancer was a chronic disease and not an acute disease. And it seems to me that in the public's mind, cancer is an acute disease, that the big C means death. Uh, and how much is CCO doing to change the public perception of cancer and to recognize that it's not um, a death sentence? Um, on the, uh, it's interesting, on the perception side, actually one of the things that we're involved in on the benchmarking project that I talked about internationally is actually a study of, uh, and this is being done through um, uh, CPAC's uh, uh, partnership as well across Canada being involved in a multi-jurisdictional uh, study of what are the awareness belief issues uh, in, in with with cancer patients and, and families and so some interesting data is starting to come out of that uh, and understanding whether also that has a role in how how patients view their disease, but how we manage the disease, how it's managed, um, and, and that's of concern across uh, across uh, jurisdictions. I think you know we as an organisation, uh, I think traditionally have been a bit behind the scenes in terms of working with providers on quality of care and all of the tools and supports that are needed to drive measurable improvements. And I think we've seen tremendous progress. As Neil says, over the past probably five or six years, I think we've started to say we need, we need to more directly interact with patients, things like the symptom management work, uh, the uh, electronic pathway solution for patients and, and, and families. 
all of the work that we're doing around screening uh, in the province with providers, but also directly with the public on the benefits of screening, that we, through all of that work, will have a more uh, kind of, if you like, direct contact with patients and the public in Ontario about what cancer is, what the cancer system is, how they can see their journey of care, and all of that. Um, I think not only in terms of the public awareness and the patient experience going through that journey. I mean, part of the reason why we're embarking on this is that we believe that it's actually going to be critical to all of the goals around sustainability of the health system, quality in the health system by providers. If we, if we bring patients and families more into what, what care they're receiving, uh, what the public can expect from the system, we'll be enabled to, to improve, the system, uh, improve the system more generally. So Shalom, give up the mic for a moment, would you? I have a question back here, and then yeah, Sarah. Just, could, uh, Anton, let me just make one quick comment on Shalom's last okay. question, just on sort of cancer as a chronic disease. I mean, Rick and Michael, Michael have both talked about sort of CCOs increasing sort of efforts to view the whole cancer journey. But I think a big part of that, Shalom, has been the consideration of survivorship and recognition that people's cancer experience doesn't end when the treatment ends. And, and I think there's a there's an understanding that that's a big piece that still needs to be addressed and is, is in many ways untapped. Just one part of that work that's very important, I think, is again being where this is a work in progress for us is our engagement with primary care. Uh, because I think a lot of these issues around perception, public awareness, uh, are importantly influenced by the work of primary care and certainly with an initial focus on screening and performance in screening but with other tools uh, around survivorship uh, and engaging primary care more strongly in the system and then enabling their links to patients are going to be a key factor in, in our work to, to improve those issues. Okay, way at the back and then we'll go back to your mic Sarah. Wondering if you can provide us a couple updates. I think the colorectal cancer screening program was outstanding. It was benchmarked. There was significant funding, I think, from 07 through to 2011. So going forward, what does that screening program look like, both from a funding and provider perspective? And then secondly, any update with regards to reducing surgical wait times related to cancer procedures? Um, yeah, I'll... I'll Try, I'll answer the first one first. So the colorectal screening program, yes, thank you for the comment. I think that was a, a tremendous effort uh, working with other organizations, uh, getting the, the technology platforms in place to launch that program. Uh, we know, I mean, the evidence is very good uh, that colorectal cancer screening is effective in reducing uh, mortality and, uh, and the treatment complications that result from advanced stage treatment for, for colorectal cancer patients. Uh, and, and so I think it has started well with respect to engaging the public primary care around the benefits of colorectal cancer screening. But I think if you look at all of the uh, the, the, the use of FOBT, colonoscopy in the system, flexible sigmoidoscopy, we're still only reaching probably just over half of the eligible population for colorectal cancer screening for the province. Um, I'm going to get my birthday card from colon cancer check in about eight months uh, and I'm going to respond to it and, and act on it and I hope you all do because we do have work to do. We have the, I think we have the platform in place, we have the networks in place, we're developing the products. We're very uh, pleased that the, uh, the screening activity reports that you'll probably remember from about a year and a half ago got caught up in uh, issues of use of paper and Canada Post. So we've just launched uh, new screening activity reports for colon cancer check online in an electronic format, easy to use for providers now across the province. And, and the plan there is to expand that, of course, for breast and, and cervical cancer as well. So I think we, we have the, the, the initiatives, the programs, the data in place to really drive 
uh, improvements to a much higher level of the, um, uh, of the eligible population participating in that program. With respect to cancer surgery, uh, that program's been in place. It was, it was one of the first programs around the, program, uh, the wait time strategy in the Ministry of Health back in 2004. And it, and it really is a good news story. Um, I, I know recently John Irish, who uh, is our provincial lead for cancer surgery in the province, told me just the other day that one of the recent previous months hit again uh, the highest level of percentage of patients in Ontario who are receiving their cancer surgery within the, within the target times that we've set. I think we're at or just above 80% now of all of those cancer surgery is being done. And some of those very, I think, high threshold in terms of the targets that the experts have set that we should be achieving uh, in the province. And that's been a work of over many years, use of good data provided by uh, Rick's team uh, amongst um, uh, a whole bunch of health services uh, data for access across the province. But critically, I think a story of uh, a network of leaders and providers in cancer surgery across the province using that data to drive improvements. And I think the other important thing is that we've used that as a lever the network of surgical leaders across the province have used that as a lever not only to drive improvements in wait times, but a whole set of quality improvements in cancer surgery uh, in the province as a whole. So it's, it's a, from my perspective, a really good news story in terms of organizations working together, clinical providers, experts, driving improvements uh, in cancer surgery across the province. Just a question about data, uh, coming back to the issue that sort of data as it drives system improvement and quality of care is certainly something that we're all uh, sort of well aware of and interested in. But the other question of data quality and the quality of the data itself. So does CCO have a comprehensive systematic approach to sort of addressing that issue on an ongoing basis? And also related to that, is there any approach around leveraging existing data sources, uh, administrative data sources at the provincial level? Because it's a very powerful tool that Ontario uh, has uh, quite a sort of uh, an expertise in. So obviously, um, the best analysis resulting in the, the most fantastic reporting is kind of worthless if the underlying data aren't uh, uh, accurate and, and dependable. So yes, we do have a, uh, what we think anyways, a very robust data quality program where we constantly uh, inspect, test, uh, and validate our data. However, much of the data that we use, some of the data that supported that analysis that uh, I briefly showed you, do not originate uh, from us or from operations that we have anything to do with. And in some cases, those data were collected for a completely different purpose than that which we use the data for. So it's really important for us or anyone else that's repurposing or reusing data to understand the context uh, uh, for which the data were originally uh, collected. Uh, there are a couple of recent examples where, um, uh, and I won't go into them, but where we've discovered that um, the data that we were using for one purpose, because the people who collected it didn't think about that, had some holes in it, and we had to go back and, and address those. So, in summary, Data quality, obviously important. Secondly, we have a comprehensive program. And by the way, we'd, I'd be happy to share that with uh, anybody who, who wants it. But third, I think there's a community challenge here for how do we collectively ensure the accuracy of our data and ensure that when we share it, we do so understanding its context. Just one more question over here. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so one question, actually two questions, they're kind of related. Do you use vendor-specific um, technologies or tools to uh, house the data and collect the data? And also, um, is this data readily available to, let's say, uh, industry partners uh, to also analyze the data? 
So with respect to the technology, uh, we've got one of everything. Um, well, not quite, but uh, probably too many of uh, those kinds of tools. Uh, and yes, we use the same analytical tools everybody else uses, uh, uh, and so there's no, no magic there. Uh, I facetiously mentioned our, our people, and that's where the magic is, uh, I think, in this business. Then um, the second part of your, your question about um, the um, how we're going to ensure that we're using these tools correctly and that the output from those tools is something that's shareable. I won't get into the various regulations and constraints about who can see what and, and PHI and so forth, but it's important for us to make sure that we can produce information that can be shared. Because after all, if we can't share it with anybody, it's less valuable. Now, precisely what those boundaries are and who can see what kind of information and so on, as I'm sure all of you know, can get pretty complicated pretty fast. But it is our intention to completely share that information, uh, which we're able to do. Just give you uh, one example. It's not with a with a private vendor, but you know one of the things that we realized uh, a couple of years ago, I guess, was looking at our data holdings. Uh, just as an example, and looking at uh, ISIS, uh, we realized that there were tremendous opportunities to leverage across the two organizations, and we went through and, and, and all of the kind of regulations and issues around being able to do this came into play and a lot of due diligence, but what has resulted is that both organizations now have access to much greater uh, data holdings with which we might be able to do uh, sophisticated analysis uh, both at the CCO end with respect to operational issues of quality uh, improvement and uh, at the ISIS end in terms of uh, high quality scientific research evaluating our system and, and being able to provide inputs as to how we make improvements in the future. So it's just exa one example I think in terms of uh, us continuing to look for ways to combine data sets in better ways uh, with other organizations so that we can all do uh, a better job. So in the last question is going to be an insider question. I'm going to go to Patrick Powers who travels across Canada representing uh, HIMS Analytics. And um, as it happens, we have the, uh, a board member of HIMS Analytics who might an end up answering that question. Patrick, a question, not a speech. <laughs> Clever, as it turns out, the question was asked about four minutes ago, so thank you very much. For that. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> oh, here we go. So I think, uh, Rick, you've mentioned the challenge of linking data and having disparate data holdings across the province and challenges with privacy and sharing information. What do you think we can be doing as a system to enable this more so that um, taking this big data that exists across different organizations and entities can be more readily used to improve the system and experience for patients? Well, the simple and not actually facetious answer is work together. Um, and I think we've started that. Uh, Kaihai, ISIS, us, some folks out of the ministry have started an effort to um, collaborate around one, identifying our data needs, and then secondly, seeing whether we can cut through some of the, uh, the red tape, I'll, I'll call it, uh, in order to be able to share more of our data. But I think that it's, and I can say this because I'm not going to be here in a bit, um, so don't, don't cringe, Michael. Um, Needs, needs some leadership. Um, information is critical to managing our health system. 
and siloed information is just as dangerous and bad as siloed operations. And so we need some leadership at the provincial level to identify, share, and better utilize information. And, um, and I'm sorry that I haven't gotten that done in my time here. So I uh, Rick, if you uh, don't happen to like Virginia, <laughs> maybe we can send you a note. <laughs> So uh, I've known Hims Analytics for many years, and Rick is on the board. So hopefully, maybe in that, with that hat, we'll have you back sometime and, and participate in some more of these. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for presenting today, Rick Skinner. <laughs> Michael, you're losing a great resource, but uh, obviously you got things well in hand. We really appreciate it, and uh, I know Neil speaks well of you. So I think your job is secure. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Neil, for being here, and thank you for coming to Breakfast with the Chiefs. Thank you.